Hi, this is Scott Morrison. Welcome to the Foothills Calvary YouTube channel. We're a church located in Lakewood, Colorado as part of the Calvary Chapel movement. Our goal is to provide an opportunity for you to hear the whole word of God preached chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Make sure you hit the subscribe button and follow along as we read God's word together. We hope you find this channel encouraging and that God speaks to you through his word and through the Holy Spirit. Well, good morning, church. Uh, my name is John Nunley, and I usually get the opportunity to preach at uh, Legacy Christian Fellowship up in Thornton, and, um, but today I have such a, a neat blessing um, to be able to be with you today and to give Pastor Scott uh, the, the day off, uh, much needed. You know, Pastor Scott is a dear brother uh, of mine. Um, he is so faithful. Um, he is a faithful man of God. He's faithful to the scriptures. He's faithful to his family. And so you guys are very blessed uh, to have Scott as your pastor. He is um, just a stalwart brother. And he's, he's tenderhearted too. Um, he's, you know, a big, tough looking dude. But he has such a soft heart and such a gentle spirit. And I would love to grow up to be like Scott. We'll see. Uh, I've got a long way to go. Um, but please remember, always remember to pray for your pastor. He's just some dude, right, that the Lord has called. Uh, he's just a man, and um, he, he gets weary because he's a giver, um, and especially, you know, trying to be that godly man through all the struggles at home. Please be praying for Pam all the time, and be praying that their time away this weekend with family, with the kids and grandkids would be just a blessed and refreshing time. But please, please, please remember to pray for Scott. Love that guy. So friends, if you would, please, we're going to be in Romans chapter 12 today, Romans chapter 12. And we're going to be talking about transformation, transformation, which is not an easy topic, though it is constant. Everybody wants to change, and they're always working to change themselves and reinvent themselves. But I got to tell you, please don't fall into a very easy trap. I got to tell you that the Lord Jesus does not want you to try harder to just be a little better. I don't know if you've felt that way, like, oh, you know, I know I, know I need to be a better Christian, or I should just try harder. That's not what this is about. The Lord Jesus wants to completely overhaul your life, starting with your heart and your mind, so that you can receive the Father's love and then give that love back to God with all that you are. And so we are giving to the Lord our love with all of our heart, our mind, our soul, and our strength. So there's no part that's left out. And the Lord Jesus affirms this fact, and he's quoting from Deuteronomy, but he's affirming this truth that we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And sometimes we put some of that on the table, like I'll give that to the Lord, but this is mine. But the Lord wants all of you. He wants all of you, all of you. But he wants to do a transformational work and then we are, to, we are to joyfully give back to him the love that, that Christ has shown to us. That's all we're doing. You know that, right? It's we're just giving back what we've been given. And friends, I know you, you know this. We know this, but we can, we can slip into that mindset of, yeah, Lord, I, I know I could try a little harder or do a little better, but it's not little anything. Uh, we're not going from pretty good to a little better. In reality, we're going from, I was the walking dead zombie apocalypse to an entirely new creation, being born again with new purpose, now with actual hope, being a, a lovely, a lovely and, and a loving Christ follower. We're talking about complete transformation here. Church isn't a makeover show where they show up to some person or some house and say, well, you know, it's, 
it's got good bones. They always talk about a house having good bones. Or this person, well, you know, it's kind of a blank slate and we're just gonna put a little paint or uh, another term, we're gonna put a little lipstick on this pig. You know, um, we're just gonna dress it up a little bit to make this house ready. But friends, we're talking about a word that you probably know, metamorphosis. Going from something to something else. And this is on the heels, this complete transformation is on the heels of the gospel, specifically what we all just went through and celebrated the triumphant entry of the Lord Jesus Christ coming into Jerusalem. That last supper, his final week headed to the crucifixion and the death of Christ being placed in a tomb and celebrating the risen Lord. You know Jesus is alive, right? Yeah. Okay, good. So Jesus is alive. He has risen. And this is the culmination of the application, if you will, of having a risen Lord as our Lord. We get to be new. We get to walk in newness of life. This is the kind of transformation. And you think, man, all this transformation talk, that, that sounds really hard. If you start feeling exhausted already and you're sitting down, I mean, if you feel exhausted, like transformation, that takes a lot of work. And you have already, in five minutes, you've already slipped back into, oh, I just need to try a little harder to be a little bit better. We slip right back into works-based transformation. And that's not the reality in Christ Jesus. It's not hard, why? Because you and I are simply giving back, we are giving in response to what we've been given in Christ Jesus. Jesus did the hard part. All the hard part Jesus did. He gave his life and his goodness in return for our sin and mistreatment of him. So we're giving what we've been given. Jesus came and gave the opposite of what we gave him. When Christ was reviled, he did not revile in return who himself bore our sins in his own body on a tree that, that we having died to sin might live for righteousness by whose stripes you were healed. Jesus did not give back to us what we gave to him. As Pastor St Scott taught last weekend, he says, if we were in Jesus' sandals, uh, we might have reacted quite differently toward those who abandoned us like the disciples did in our time of greatest need. In response to our sinful state, and disobedience, the Lord Jesus overcame sin and death by his obedience. Jesus didn't revile in return, but he blessed his disciples. And he blessed his disciples with the Holy Spirit and accompanying gifts. And he's doing the same in us. He didn't die again, die and rise again so that we could be the same or be a little better, but that we may be transformed. It should be noticeable. We should let it out of the bag that we are a new creation in Christ, that we can not only be transformed, but then be ready to know and to do God's will. Because if we're just gonna try to do God's will, but not be transformed by Him, we're gonna be doing things our own way in our own efforts, and that's not going anywhere. So we need to be transformed. and so. Romans chapter 12 here, I see it as an application of living this truth. So look with me, uh, Romans chapter 12, verse one. Therefore, I exhort you brothers by the mercies of God to present your bodies as a sacrifice, living, holy, and pleasing to God, which is your, and your translations may say, which is your spiritual service of worship. Your other translations, may say, which is your reasonable service. And so the, there's this contrast between the dying sacrifice, so the death of animals, but the Lord Jesus, when he died, he fulfilled the sacrificial system. And so death isn't affording anything. We are to give our lives as a living sacrifice. And he says, which is your reasonable, so your text may say spiritual, but it's the word logikos, 
which is where we get the word logical. It's your logical, reasonable, rational service of worship. It's not extraordinary that we worship the Lord. It's only reasonable for what He has done. In verse 2, quite famously, and many of you know this verse, and do not be conformed to this world, but instead, what? Be transformed transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may approve what is the will of God, that which is good and pleasing and perfect. So you and I are being changed from the inside out. We are being transformed in order to accomplish God's perfect will. And the transformation, you know it has to begin somewhere, right? And with Jesus, and every time he taught, whether he was explaining the, the true purpose of the law or some aspect of, of cultural law, he always made it a heart issue. So we know it always begins in the heart. The transformation begin, begins in the heart. The, the spirit within changing the heart unto salvation. So we must be spiritually born again. The heart has to be changed. As Jesus taught, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot, he cannot see the kingdom of God. And only then may we, by the leading of the Holy Spirit, discern what is the perfect will of God. We have to have the Holy Spirit within. And that's what's happening. And, and I pray that you have received the Lord Jesus personally as your Savior because the work of the Lord Jesus the mighty blood of Christ cleanses our heart. So this temple, the temple of our heart, the place where God desires to dwell, He cannot live, He cannot dwell in a sinful state. And so the blood of Jesus washes our heart clean, empties out, cleans out this temple in order to be filled so the Spirit of the living God is now living inside of us. That is a transformation in, in and of itself. And so that is how, with the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, that we may know the will of God. But God has revealed these things to us, like in 1 Corinthians 2, um, through His Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. So if you're searching for the will of God, make sure by faith you've received the grace of Christ, the saving grace of the Lord Jesus, so that you can receive His Holy Spirit directing you to the will of God. So the heart has to be transformed first. Because we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. And so secondly here would be transformation that is occurring by the renewing of our mind. We are no longer to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Friends, our thinking must change in order for our actions and our Christian service to be holy and pleasing to God. How we think, the way we go about thinking, what we get stuck thinking about, it matters. And our minds are for the Lord. They are to be, our minds are to be placed in the Lord's hands. Say, Lord, renew my mind, heal my mind, because the way I think and the things I think about, they're just not godly. And I get stuck so often, Lord, I need the renewing of my mind instead of just regurgitating what the world and its garbage has for me. Our thinking must change. So what is our job? If the Lord is doing this transformational work, what is our job or responsibility might help? What is our responsibility? Well, I think primarily in all of this, uh, we must not resist change. We must not be stubborn and resist change. Jesus came that we be changed. But as far as I can tell, lights are pretty bright. We're all humans, yeah, okay. Humans, I've found, hate change. Every once in a while, there'll be somebody like, oh, yeah, it'd be fine. But so far, I'm like, hey, raise your hand if you really love change. I don't have any takers so far, though some are better to roll with the punches than others. But when you wake up tomorrow, you're probably going to want things to be the same. You don't want to wake up 
like in the middle of the ocean, your bed kind of floating. Like, wait a second. You want to go to where you expected to go? You want to find the same people that you expected to find? We don't really like change. Why? Well, a lot of reasons. Primarily because we were made in God's image, but then our sin nature hijacked that and we thought, hey, I'm made in God's image. I must be God. I must be in control. I want things my way. So it's, it's a bit of a broken God complex and uh, a, a couple dashes of selfishness. And so we just like things to go our own way. And when that doesn't happen, we usually flip out. At least I do. And so what, what must we do? We must submit to the Lord to allow Him to change us, to allow Him to get us moving, to send us, to sit us down, to have us serve in new ways or to a new person, to get outside of our control comfort zone and get our minds truly renewed to start thinking a different way, start thinking Jesus' way. Because status quo down here is selfishness or laziness, sin and death. This is just our broken carnal nature. It is by change that we can present ourselves as a living sacrifice. We are supposed to be the people that say, here I am, Lord. I'm changed because of you. And so here I am. Use me. I want to serve you. I want to worship you, Lord. And it's only reasonable considering all that you've done for me. This is how our minds should be operating. Lord, how may I please you? How may I serve you? Lord, what are you doing? I want to be there. When Paul writes, be transformed, okay? I don't want to get too nerdy with you. But here in Romans 12, he says, be transformed. So it's a command, what we would call an imperative. It's, it is the word, and you'll be familiar with the root word, it's in the Greek, uh, metamorphuste. So you have your, your tense of the word built in. So that's where we get the word metamorphosis, all right? Metamorphuste. So it is a verb. It's an action word. So there should be some action to it. Plus, it is an imperative. An imperative would be um, stand up, sit down, be quiet, shout to the Lord. It's, it's an instruction, imperative. So be transformed. But it's present passive in its tense. In effect, what is being spoken here when we delve deeply into the word is do, so imperative, and be now present what has already been effectuated, what has already been done for you in the past. So that's the passive, okay? Do or be now what has already been accomplished in the past. That's pretty deep when you think about this transformation is occurring and we are to be transformed in the right now on what Christ has already done. So we acknowledge it, that God has transformed us in Christ and is transforming us in Christ, and we can be that right now. And every single time our minds slip back into the old ways, the old patterns, dwelling on the old garbage, doing things the old way, we get to be new. Again, we are living proof, celebrating the resurrection of Lord Jesus Christ. We cannot forget that. It's been a week since last Sunday, Resurrection Sunday. And so each day we are celebrating in our very existence that we are something new, that we are risen, that we are not stuck in our worldliness. Here I am, Lord. I get to be now based on what you have done. And friends, we might as well get on board with change. We might as well get on board the change train now because do you know what's going to happen to you? I do. If you are in the Lord Jesus Christ, I know because the Word of God tells us in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, behold, I tell you a mystery that we will not all sleep but we all shall be, what? Do you know this verse? Changed. That's right. In the moment, in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised, 
and we will be changed. So we might as well get on board with the fact that we will be changed. See, we're going to be changed away from flesh and blood that cannot inherit the kingdom. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. But spiritual bodies, so eventually this body of death that we're trapped in at the moment, even that will be changed. And then we'll, we will see this complete metamorphosis. We will be changed into immortal, incorruptible bodies. It's coming. So in the meantime, until that final trumpet blows, what does this transformation look like, act like, minister like? said differently, what is the application of this internal, because right now it's all an internal transformation. Now it should come out. It should come out. So what should it look like? Well, then you start getting into number three, the reformation of the soul. So we are to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, with all of our mind and all of our soul. Now, what you'll find in scripture is that kind of heart and soul gets translated um, and interchanged a little bit. But the word soul is the word psuche, right? It looks like your psyche, P-S-Y-C-H-E. And that is where we get the word our psyche. It is, um, it is how we feel, our emotions about how we feel and, and kind of who we are, how we feel about us, okay? That's your psuche. And so it's translated here as soul. And so there is even a reformation of kind of how we feel about ourselves. There is nothing that's off the table for Jesus to change, to transform. So Romans chapter 12, verse 3 now, for through the grace given to me, I say to each one of you, not to think more highly of himself than he ought to think, but think so as to have sound thinking or be sober-minded, you may have learned this, as God has allotted to each a measure of faith. So what are we talking about here? Not to think so highly of yourself. What we're talking about is humility. Humility is this great sign of the transformation of soul. We're not obsessed with ourselves, even our own, um, either aggrandizement, so our, our being puffed up, but the other side of pride, the dark side of pride, pride is an obsession with maybe our worthlessness. It's still just pride, it's just wounded pride, but it keeps the emphasis on self. So whether we're puffing ourselves up or casting ourselves down, that's not true humility because it's all about us. And so we have to be very careful about these things, but trust that the Lord is changing even how we feel. So since the object, the goal, is to love the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, and soul and strength, the Lord is overhauling our psuche, our, our soul, the seat of feelings, desires, uh, affections, and aversions. We all have all of those things. Your feelings are fine. God gave us emotion. He gave us this sense of how we feel about us. That's part of who God has made us to be. But those things can't drive the bus. Those things aren't the, the commanders of truth. We are not slaves to how we feel about us. We are to be the servants of the living God, right? So we have to be transformed even there. And there is one thing that blocks our witness for the Lord Jesus. One thing that always gets in the way of following Jesus every time, it'll be pride. And so humility is this, is this great transformation of soul by which we can receive all the good that God has for us. Pride will always block it because pride says, oh, I don't need all that. Oh, I'm good. Or I'm mostly good. Or I'm basically a good person. I don't need the mighty blood of Jesus. I don't need to surrender to God. I'm good. Or I can do this in my own strength. Or I'm going to think this way because that's how I've always thought. And I'm not going to change that for anybody. When the Lord's saying, I want, you to, I want you to receive what I have. And pride would say, no, 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 later. But humility, surrendering to the Lord. Think about humility being the conduit, a big giant pipeline by which all the goodness of God, yes, that pipeline has to be affixed by faith, certainly, but humility, walking in humility is how we receive all 
the good of the Lord. And Jesus gave us that example. And pride just puts a kink in the hose of receiving all the good. We cannot resist this fundamental transformation away from what is selfish or prideful to our joy of just being humble servants of the Lord. It's only reasonable, remember. Jesus is our example. When we're talking about transformation and everything, Jesus is always our example. But can you think about how Jesus was transformed? Well, Jesus is the, a good example of the extent. Think about this. Um, John's gospel, John, the beginning of John, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. That's mighty, okay? That is powerful. That is Godhead. But 14 verses later, and the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory. The glory is if, as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus was even transformed from being with and God in the triune God, to becoming flesh. The Word became flesh. That's great change. And He didn't stop there. It was Jesus who came to earth, and Philippians chapter 2 tells us that Jesus emptied Himself, taking the form of a slave. So that's pretty big, to go from almighty triune God to the form of a human slave. If Jesus is willing to take on this level of transformation in a matter of obedience, so should we. So should we. He says, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient. How far? All the way. Obedient even unto death, death on the cross. So again, that's you know, Philippians 2, uh, 7 and 8. And again, I want to stress the extent of this change, this transformation. And we get not only the picture of the Lord Jesus Christ humbling himself as a slave, but then we have another account in Mark chapter 9, verse 1, says, and Jesus says to his disciples, assuredly I say to you that there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God present with power. So you think, where is the kingdom of God? The answer will always be in the presence of the king. Wherever the king is, that's the kingdom, and the king is the Lord Jesus, and he has power, obviously, and see the kingdom of God present with power. Now, it says after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, because they were always in trouble, and he kept them really close. You might think, wow, it'd be so cool to be one of the three. Only if you're big trouble, and Jesus couldn't let them out of his sight for a minute. He's like, you three, come with me. Because they were always in some power struggle because they wanted to be in charge. And they were about to see the kingdom of God present with power. So he takes them up on the mountain, on a high mountain apart by themselves. And what happens? And Jesus was transfigured. So you've heard probably of the Mount of Transfiguration. He was transfigured. What was the Greek root? It's where we get the word metamorphosis. It's the same word that we're talking about, be transformed. Jesus was transformed, transfigured before them, and his, show, and his clothes uh, became shining, exceedingly white like snow, uh, such as no launderer on earth uh, could ever whiten them. This is the extent. Think about it. The Lord Jesus, as triune God, He was with God, He was God, He was the Word of God. Then the Word became flesh, and the Word became apparent, took the form of a slave. And then he was transfigured, and his Godhead popped out a little bit, and then he stuffed it all back in, and then he went to the cross, wounded for our transgressions, brutalized, crucified as a common criminal, not even as like a Roman citizen. They didn't crucify Roman citizens. This was reserved for the lowest of the low. He was put in a tomb. And then he rose from the dead and ascended into heaven. So Jesus is doing this huge, huge extent of transformation. And how dare we go, oh, I just, I want to be left alone. I don't want to change. The Lord's like, hey, you need, you need to change that. Oh, I don't want to change. 
You need to do something new. Oh, I don't want to do that. Hey, maybe you should be, you know, a greeter. Oh, I don't know about that. Maybe you should help out in children's ministry and your hair, you know, catches on fire and you run away. Don't worry. Don't worry. Don't resist change. Jesus was willing for love's sake to be transformed. And he's doing the same in me and you. He was willing to put all that down for, for glory, for eventual glory. This is the kind of transformation. That's why at the beginning, I'm like, this isn't about just trying a little bit harder. Oh, yeah, I should probably do a little bit better. Now, are we all a work in progress? Yes, absolutely. God is working in us daily, but we can't resist this. We're being transformed from prideful to humble to glorified in due time. We're just following the track of Jesus. Friend, the Lord loves you. You know that, I hope. I pray you know the Lord loves you, and He knows you. You're not fooling Him. He loves you anyway. He loves you because He loves you, and He always has. He knows where you've messed up. He knows the things that hold you back. He knows the things you dwell on, and He still, He loves you dearly. And so the seat, the center of our emotions, and how, the how you feel about you, that even that is being healed by the Lord. You don't have to worry so much about you. God's got you. Do you know that? He has a plan. So you don't have to be consumed with you. The Lord has you. Humble yourself. We get to, this is in uh, 1 Peter 5. He says, therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. In due time. This is what we saw in Jesus. It was deferred glory, deferred glory. His focus on earth was about obedience to the Lord. He just humbled himself before the Father, did the Lord's will, and what happened was the Lord's will, and Jesus walked through it, and in due time, he was glorified on the cross, which we're like, yikes, I don't want to be glorified like that. We don't want to face persecution. We don't want to face hardship. But he had already said, cheer up, I've overcome the world. Yes, you're going to face hardship and tribulation. Jesus was glorified on the cross, but then he was certainly glorified in a way we can better understand in his resurrection. This is the model we've been given. So let him transform your soul, your psyche, how you feel about you, so that we can have all of us aligned, loving Christ with our entire being, our entire person. And so the transformation of self, heart, mind, and soul, leads to a transformation of, finally, strength. Our efforts, our actions, our abilities that were given to us by the Lord in the first place in order to be used for the Lord. Follow with me in Romans 12, 4. Now, just as we have many members in one body, and all the members do not have the same function, so we, who are many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. Verse 6, but having gifts that differ, remember that, church, gifts that differ according to the grace given to us, whether prophecy in agreement with the faith, or service in his serving, or he who teaches in his teaching, or he who exhorts in his exhortation, he who gives with generosity, he who leads, or here in verse 8, he who leads, how? With diligence. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. So these are spiritual gifts that are used to glorify God and to edify, strengthen one another. These are not given by the Holy Spirit to exalt self. These are given according to grace. What does that tell you? That should tell you, don't be jealous of other people's gifts and abilities. They didn't earn them in the first place. It was given as a matter of grace. The gifts were given by grace, and people, we, are responsible for using them correctly for the kingdom. And that's why God's Word gives us here instruction as to how to use the gifts rightly. Like, like in verse 8, he who leads with diligence. If you're going to lead, it can't be with blindness and laziness. 
It has to be with diligence that we are paying attention to what the Lord has for us. We can't just be absent-minded and say that we're leading. If we're going to lead, it must be, the Word tells us, with diligence. And, let's see, he who shows mercy with cheerfulness. You can't, oh, I'll forgive you, and then like hold it against them. You can't show somebody mercy and then grumble about it. If you're going to be merciful, which is not giving somebody the judgment they deserve, which has been issued to us, God has been merciful to us, amen? He did not give us the penalty of death for our sin, but instead gave us grace, His unmerited uh, good favor. And so mercy is not getting what we do deserve. So if we're going to show mercy and care for people, we can't begrudgingly care about people and show them great mercy and serve them. No, we have to do it with cheerfulness. So we even have instruction about how to do this. So you can see that even our service to the Lord must be transformed by the Lord. Our carnal nature would try to hijack the gifts and try to use them for our own notoriety or personal prosperity. And that kind of thing happens all the time, unfortunately. Using the gifts of the Spirit are by the Spirit and for His work on earth. Look, if we're going to do anything for the Lord, and it's really noble to say, Lord, I want to do something for you. I want to do big things for you. Please understand that the reality is you're not doing anything for the Lord. We're doing things from the Lord. That's a big difference. All of the good that we are doing, quote, for the Lord, it all came from Him in the first place. We are just giving back to Him what He has given to us. We're just working for the Lord. And this transformation produces action. Look at all these action words starting in verse 9, Romans 12. And let love be without hypocrisy by abhorring what is evil and clinging to what is good. I love that action of clinging to what is good. Because if you're not clinging to the Lord, you will be swept away by just the torrent of garbage that this world has. It's just flowing out of every device we have conversations we're having out in the world. It's just all this mess. And so I love this idea of clinging to what is good so we don't just get swept away in our thoughts, swept away in our actions in a, a flood of dissipation, the word says in a different place. So clinging to what is good, being devoted, verse 10, being devoted to one another in brotherly love, giving preference to one another in honor, not lagging behind in diligence, being fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. So are we to serve the Lord? Absolutely. Is this reserved for just a couple of folks, a couple of faithful? Well, no. It, this is for us all. This is about the basics of Christian living being transformed in the Lord. We are to serve Him somehow, some way. Now, are we all supposed to serve the same way? No, of course not. God has made us to be very unique, and He's given us unique gifts and abilities. But we are to be fervent in spirit. Fervent in spirit. There should be a fire in your belly to serve the Lord Jesus to talk about the Lord Jesus with your friends, family, coworkers, classmates. We should be fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, rejoicing in hope. Who should the most joyful people on the planet be? The people who've been saved by grace through faith. That's us, church. We are the body of Christ. Our head is Jesus. He is the head of all things to the church. We should be joyful even in the midst of trial and tribulation. Joyful, not dour. The Holy Spirit is not like lemon juice. It's the oil of gladness. We should be rejoicing in hope, persevering in affliction, because this is not some baloney where, oh, accept Christ and it's all going to go swimmingly for you. No, it's going to be hard because you're now turning upstream against the world. Fervent in spirit, right? persevering in affliction, being devoted to prayer, 13, contributing to the needs of the saints, pursuing hospitality. You see how much action is involved? The kind of strength, this kind of strength, effort, action, this is impossible without Christ's transform transformation. 
but it's certainly attainable in Christ if we are all fervent in spirit, serving the Lord, contributing to the needs of the saints, pursuing hospitality. Seek what the Lord would have for you. Seek ways to serve other people. We should all be taking turns, serving in different aspects to be the body of Christ, working together. Because when we're doing this, when we are fervent in these ways, our homes, our church communities, our neighborhoods, our schools, our cities can truly flourish. And us, as Christ followers, we should be leading the charge. Now, if you think that uh, loving and helping the needy is challenging, just read on. It gets harder. Verse 14, bless those who persecute you. And you're like, come on. This gets harder and harder. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those. So we have to be relatable. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. By being of the same mind toward one another, not being haughty in mind, but associating with the humble. And do not be wise in your own opinion. At this point, every one of us on the inside should really be desperately crying out to the Lord, oh, I need transformation for this. Now, some of you may be really excellent at blessing people that persecute you, but it's not common. Like, oh yeah, bring it on, praise God. (laughs) I hate your guts. God bless you, brother. (laughs) I mean, it should be that preposterous of a change. That when people revile us, oh, you're some kind of Christian. Yes, I am. You want to hear about him? No. Okay. (laughs) We don't want to be, you know, shining a spotlight in people's faces. Repent, ye sinner, right? Or to Hades you shall go. I don't know anybody who gets saved from that kind of a ministry. Maybe from time to time. Maybe pirates. I don't know. Yar. (laughs) Whatever works. But we need to be the kind of people who can respond like Jesus and not revile in return, but bless those who persecute you. Not be wise in our own opinion. We don't give the gospel so that we can win arguments. We give the gospel to win souls for eternity. And their lives are hanging in the balance and they think they are right. And they're willing to fight tooth and nail to be right, to destroy themselves. And we have to be more loving than they are hateful or bitter or angry or stubborn or stuck. It's for us to be so transformed by Christ that it is easy to see and we should be easy to love. Transform me, Lord. I can't do this on my own. My mind and my flesh would never agree to living Romans 12. My flesh is too busy defending my insecurities and protecting and justifying my roots of bitterness. Change me, Lord. Please kill this flesh in me. Kill that habit in me. Kill me dead, Lord. Bury me in the tomb and resurrect the real me that you died for, the real me that is to live on in your kingdom, to represent you well. Fashion me in your resurrection, Jesus. I want to live this resurrection. And so, yes, I must take up my cross and follow you. I must put the old man in the tomb and walk in newness of life. Verse 17, never paying back evil to anybody. Never paying back evil for evil to anybody. I'm like, never? Ever? Respecting what is good in the sight of all men, if possible, so far as it depends on you. I love that. Being at peace with all men. Because sometimes it's just not possible. You're going to have cantankerous people in your life that that strive and thrive on conflict. May we not be those people, certainly, but with others, as much as depends on us, we should live at peace with other people. 
Never taking our own revenge, beloved. Instead, leave room for the wrath of God, for it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. Verse 20, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. See, this world on both sides, I don't care what news you ascribe to, what bad news you ascribe to, it's all bad news these days. I don't care what side of the aisle, so to speak, you are on certain issues. The rhetoric from both sides is us versus them. Don't buy into this. Because the gospel, the word in action is saying, but if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Like things are gonna just melt their brain. Melt their brain with your goodness. And the more they revile you, love them all the more. And if their head explodes, the head explodes. Win-win. It takes amazing strength to remain humble in times of trial and persecution. And that strength does not come from ourselves. It is the power of God's Holy Spirit. We are to love the Lord our God with all of our strength, our effort, our abilities that come from Him. Do not, verse 21, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. You have something to give this world. It is the goodness of God, and you will overcome. Why? Because the Lord is already triumphant. He is victorious. He is the overcomer, and He loves to share His victory with those that He has transformed to receive that victory. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're not able to walk in victory. Even if you have it your way, you're not walking in the victory that He has afforded you. He has transformed you to receive this. So first, overcome. God will first overcome evil in us. That's what He has done. Overcome evil in us so that we can do the same in the world around us. Change. So this great change internally should beget should create great change externally. It's in the people's lives around you. The response to the gospel is transformational Christian living that we can find right here in Romans 12. How to do this, what this ought to look like. The Lord Jesus Christ died on a cross and He rose from the grave so that we can be changed from lovers of self and conforming to this world to Loving the Lord our God with all of our heart, mind, soul, and strength. So friend, let God work in you. Be alive. Humble your heart. Let Him change you. He has great things in store. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we, we thank You for Your willingness to effectuate such great change. You are doing in us, Lord, what we could never do. Lord Jesus, you are so good for letting us share in your resurrection as we will share in your sufferings. To a degree, we will share in your glory. And one day we will be fully changed. Until then, Lord, may we not resist you. Wanting to transform our thinking how we feel, what we do, who we are. Lord Jesus, may we be the type of people that trust you enough to say, Lord, I give you me. I will lay myself down and give you me. Lord, here I am. I am your servant. Lord, and in this moment, just here at church, Lord, we get to live this. So in this moment, Every single one of us right now, we get to stand up right where we are. Church, stand up. This is the picture of standing up before the Lord saying, Lord, here I am. Use me. I want to be yours. I want to serve you. And it's only logical. It's only reasonable to give you my life because, Lord Jesus, you gave your life for me. Here I am, Lord. I don't want to be stuck anymore. I don't want to be rigid anymore. I don't want to be the tough guy or the tough chick. I want to be yours. Moldable, changeable. Shape me into whatever form 
is most usable in your hand in this moment. And it's not just for me, it's for my family, it's for my friends, it's for my coworkers, it's for my classmates, it's for my enemies. Lord, shape me to be more like you, Jesus. That our old life would be unrecognizable and we would show this world you, Jesus. You're the one that matters. And we must matter a great deal to you, Lord, that you would send your son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to die for us. We are held, we are found in you. Use me, Lord. Strip away that which is getting in the way that we may live humbly and joyfully before you. We need you, Jesus. We love you and we thank you. It's in your precious name we pray. Amen.